I got there in a hurricane and just hit Tampico. And it was actually a just hit when our flight was supposed to come in, so they delayed our flight till a couple days later, so we ended up staying in Houston waiting. But once we finally got there, we got there in the afternoon. They basically collected us from the airport in our bags and in a big van, and they drove us over to an institute building where we had like a devotional, and we had a first meeting with the president, and you know a bunch of learning opportunities where the president and his wife just started talking to us, and they basically explained you know a few basic rules, what it's like in Tampico, um, you know weather and just all sorts of stuff, climate, uh, culture, and then after that we ended up going to the mission home, where we ended up eating, and we were assigned to our trainers, and. So I was assigned um, an Ecuadorian named Elder Nieto, and he was my trainer. And it's really funny because I swear the president just wanted to pair the smallest elders with the, the tallest elders. And so like the tallest elder was with the even smaller than my companion. I'm kind of tall, so they put me with another small companion. So you have an interview with president before he assigns your, your trainer. So he basically, or generally, that's how it was in my mission. So he understands what kind of person you are and, and what's a little bit about you so he can kind of match your personality and what you need. And so after I had my first interview and before I was assigned my trainer, he actually had another second interview with me where he just said, Elder Fawcett, are you more of an Eeyore or Winnie the Pooh kind of guy? And I was just like, what the heck? How do I answer this? And so I was just like, well, I guess I'm a Winnie Pooh kind of guy. And so, okay, good, I'm just going to send you to an area which was hit kind of bad by the hurricane and you're probably going to be doing a lot of, you know, service and a lot of other things. I just want to make sure you're kind of an upbeat kind of guy and, and everything's okay, you don't get depressed or anything. It's like, no, I'm good. And so he ended up sending me to this place, which is the furthest away from any point in our mission. And there was only four missionaries there. Lair dropped down to two, me and my companion and you're stranded in the middle of nowhere and you have to go you know three hours by bus to get to the closest missionaries and so it was definitely a learning experience i loved my first area it's still one of my favorite areas and i love my trainer um, i was only with him for one transfer though so i had technically a second trainer who was american and i loved both of them i loved my experience tra uh, being trained and I loved uh, just being in Mexico because it was great. I loved it. In Tampico, well, it's really, really hot and humid because it's right on the coast. Tampico is a coastal city. It's a port city. And um, it's in the Gulf of Mexico, midway down Mexico. And um, the mission itself um, covers parts of five states in Mexico. And... No, parts of six states, and we actually go into five. No, five or four, something like that. I think it's five. And, uh, and so it's a pretty big mission as far as the missions go in Mexico. And there are seven stakes, if I remember right, and one district. And so right now they're really trying to get that district to become a stake. And, you know, that's kind of the mission president's goal as of now. And... The wards there are a little different, just as I'm sure they are outside of the U.S. The wards have anywhere from 40 to 120 people sometimes. And then the branches are even smaller, 40 max kind of. And then anywhere from 8, 10, 12 and up. But then also in the branches, the, the attendance does vary more. So I was in a branch and one time we had 12 people, but then another... Uh, another Sunday we had 44 or 48 people, so it kind of fluctuates a lot. There is a temple in Tampico right in the city, so I mean, you can all, you always go to the temple in your mission. It may not be as much as you'd like, but about, at least whenever I was there, if you were near the temple, you could go every three months or so. So the people there are mostly Catholic. They're Catholic in the way that they say they're Catholic and they have Catholic beliefs, but most of them don't go to church. A lot of them do go to church, but most of them not. They're usually really receptive 
of of listening to the missionaries and inviting them in. I think it's just the Mexican Mexican people in general, and not the people in Tampico, but they are really inviting and they're nice to you. There are a few people that that aren't so nice, but the grand part of them are really nice. They just love you and they invite you in and they'll give you something to drink, they'll give you something to eat sometimes, just for no reason, without knowing you, just for knocking on their door or whatever. And so, so that's really good. But then a lot of them will listen to you, but just kind of want to stick with what they believe. They're just like, well, I was, you know, I was raised this way. And that's what I believe. And I think that's just how I'm going to stay. And so that's kind of sad, but there are a lot of people who, who hear the gospel and they understand and, and realize that it's something better than what they have, something that can add to what they have. So, so they want to learn more. There are more baptisms in the mission than average, but um, I remember people were always saying, oh, you're going to baptize like so many people, like dozens and dozens. And I didn't baptize as many people as everyone was saying. But there are baptisms and helping people is important anyway. But sometimes it's just, you just feel good about after getting a baptism. So just wanted to mention that. So the mission present there right now is the first native mission present for that mission for, I don't know, more than a decade, maybe two decades. Um, when I first got there, there was an American in there named President Jordan. And he was actually my mission president almost the entire time until my last month whenever we got a new mission president. And so he's President Ramirez. He's from Monterey, Mexico. And uh, yeah, he's great. He has a family and um, he has a little boy. His youngest is two or three, I think. I think he's three. And, and so he's a very young mission president, extremely nice. Um, his wife is amazing as well. I only got to know them for a month, so I can't really share much, but they're extremely nice people, um, very dedicated to the work, and I'm sure that he's going to do great as the mission president. Also in the mission, to talk about what people think of missionaries, um, as I said, they normally invite us in, and even if they don't know who we are, they normally know who we are just by seeing us in the street, they know who we are by us having talked to them before. And they know that we're, we're teaching about the gospel. But there are a lot of misconceptions about that. A lot of people think we're being paid, obviously, because who would do this unpaid? And we're not. And then a lot of people believe that we're different churches. A lot of people believe that we're uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Pentecostals, because down there, both of those churches um, have very much the same approach as tracting, going door to door and talking to people. But, uh, you know, one thing we always point to was our plaque, our name tag, and we basically said, you know, if, if they have a white shirt and tie and they have this on, then, then they're an elder. They're from our church or, or a sister. And we kind of explained the difference. Another misconception is that Americans are older than they really are. I don't know why. Maybe it's the different... Uh, ethnic background of the people, but I got estimates being 18 to 20 years old in my mission, I got estimates from 25 to 45 as my age. I just liked asking it actually, I just would ask a random taxi driver, like how old do I look? He's like, I don't know, like 35? I don't know why. And they also believe because we're older that we're married for some reason. And so they're like, you know, what What did you do with your family back in the United States? I'm like, well, well, I left them, I guess, like my parents are at home and my brother and sister. No, but like your wife and stuff. I'm not married. You know, I'm 18 or 19 or 20. And so, so that was kind of interesting as well. Um, there's a bunch of misconceptions. A lot of them are, are less common. But like I said, even getting past the misconceptions, they... They really love us and, for the most part, are extremely nice. One of the most important things that an investigator needs to do before being baptized is keeping his commitments, like reading in the Book of Mormon, saying his prayers, or his or her prayers, attending church, following the commandments and everything. But one thing they seem to, to lack in my mission 
they pray, but then you're still not sure if they're praying um, really with real intent, if they're praying truly. But one of the things they struggle with is reading in the Book of Mormon. And so a lot of people, I guess it's just because they don't have a, uh, you know, a regiment. They don't have the habit of reading in the scriptures every day. And so that makes it harder for them. But a lot of them just, they don't want to read. A lot of them can read, and but sometimes they just don't want to read or they don't put time into it. So if you never read the Book of Mormon, it's kind of hard to know if the church is true and you're probably not going to be baptized. And so one of the key things to do is, is if they haven't read with what you left them the last lesson, you need to go over what you left them or even read it with them so that they understand you know, the importance. Teach them a, a lesson through what they should have read so that they gain an appreciation for the scriptures and they want to read them next time. So I served from 2013 to 2015. Um, I served starting off in an area called Soto La Marina and then I went to the hottest place in the mission called Ciudad Valles and then it was from there to a town in the south end of the mission called Tanto Yuca and from Tanto Yuca I went um, to Tampico well, actually the city right next to Tampico which is Ciudad Madero and then um, after that city, I went to Tampico, and then after Tampico, I went all the way to a place called Altamira, and that was, and I actually served in two areas in that last one, in Altamira. So, yeah, that's where I served. All great places. I really loved them, but there's obviously a few favorites in there. So the Tampico Madero area is, is really, really well developed. I was kind of surprised when I got there but it's a very large city. And it's so large, I think there's, there's four stakes in, in the city itself and one temple. Um, the city has everything you need in it from Walmart to what else? I mean, there's movie theaters, but you obviously can't go. Um, so there's, there's Walmarts, all sorts of stores that you would want. Um, it's really cool because it also has, you know, the city center which which is just you know this nice metropolitan area that mixes history with with modern lots of cool shops to visit and everything that's where all the missionaries go to buy their souvenirs before they leave everything that says Tampico on its shirts and and shells and stuff Tampico and Madero the cities themselves are urban but then at the same time very suburban I mean, it's very sprawling and very large, not like, you know, big skyscrapers like we have or anything. Everything's a couple stories tall or the buildings in the center, they're probably five or six stories tall at the most. And so everything's on a low level, but because of that, it's all very spread out and there's a lot of people who actually live in the city. And so each area varies a whole bunch, but there's a lot of people, a lot of streets, I personally don't like working in the city because I feel just, I don't know, I feel like it's not as open and that I'm more like restricted in my other areas. I just had the whole town and so I could go wherever I wanted. But then in a city it's different because you have area, you have limits and so you can only go, you know, so many blocks this way or that way without leaving your area. But overall the city it's a pretty big city, I'm not going to lie, I was very surprised. Tampico, like I said, is a coastal city, but it's also, because it's a port, is, is also, uh, it has a few chemical and, and gas refineries in it, so it's also like a petrochemical kind of place. And so there's a lot of people who work at the plants, there's a lot of people who work for people who work at the plants, and there's even a whole medical giant hospital for people who work at the plants. And so that's a big business there as well as the seafood industry, you know, shrimp and fish. A lot of people dedicate themselves to that. A lot of people, that's their job, that's their career. And Tampico historically has been known to flood. There have been severe floods in Tampico where the water in, in some areas has risen up to 10 or 12 feet but I never got to see anything like that. You just see pictures all over the place about, 
of of the city with just all of its streets flooded and people going down the streets in boats. And it's kind of really funny because you're like, wow, I've walked to there. And, and so like, wow, how could that be under six feet of water? And so, I mean, it's, it's really amazing, but obviously I hope that, I hope that doesn't happen in the near future. The cost of living in Tampico, all missionaries, they kind of stick to a maximum of 2,000 pesos a month there. So, in, in all of the mission, so 2,000 pesos a month is kind of like 120 bucks. Yeah, something right around there. Um, maybe a little bit more. So 120 bucks a month for, for an apartment. And that generally can have AC, a water heater. Um, I mention these things because we don't think about them in the US, but in other countries you actually do. And yeah, it's, it's perfect for two missionaries, just, just the right size. And so at 120 bucks a month, that's, that's pretty cheap as far as compared to living in the US. But there are areas where it's even cheaper and, and there's some areas where it's a little more expensive because it's a little more affluent area. It's a little more, you know, kind of rich. And so you have to, you have to spend a little bit more to get a, a nicer apartment. Well, to get an apartment there. And so some of the missionaries do have a little bit nicer apartments, it seems. All the apartments in the mission practically were 2,000 pesos and under. And so in my time in the mission, the least I ever spent on an apartment was 1,500 pesos. So that's, you know, less than, a, that's 80 bucks a month or so. And then the most I ever spent actually was 2,500 pesos, which is about $200 a month. It's actually less, well, that's way less. And so, I mean, there's definitely that, that max. Usually 2,500 in a nicer area is the most we ever paid. And that was, and this was a bigger house. It wasn't, it wasn't just an apartment at the 2,500. It was an actual house. It had two bedrooms, two bath, living room, kitchen, dining area. And so, I mean, it was, it was a decently sized house. Crime and safety in the mission. You'll hear a lot of news from Tampico and, and the surrounding areas about the being really dangerous areas because in a way they are dangerous from the fact that it runs up the coast, it runs along the drug route. Tampico is, you know, part of the drug route. You, there, there is a lot of violence and a lot of crime in and around that area. But the amazing thing is as missionaries, it almost never even touches you. You hear about it, you might, you might see something, but almost nothing ever happens to the missionaries. In my entire two years in the mission, I think I knew of, of three elders who had their wallets stolen in, in my entire mission. Out of over 200 elders at, at a time, there was probably only three during my entire mission that, that had their wallets stolen that I knew of. And I, I knew pretty well because I was, I was in the offices and I dealt a lot in, in these things and almost nothing ever happened. But you should be wary of things, especially in Tampico, the city itself because there are sometimes in the summer, whenever it gets dangerous, there are gunfights, you know, so there's, you know, the, maybe it's between rival gangs or maybe it's between the police and these gangs, but either way, we, we practice procedures in the mission where if you hear gunshots, you basically, you, and if they're close by, you drop down to the floor and you, you make sure you kind of look around from the floor, make sure, you know, nothing's happening. And if someone's close by, you, you stay there, you stay put. And, you know, they, they, there's a whole procedure for everything that they teach you. But I never had to implement that in my mission. We, I did hear shots fired, but I was never close enough to anything to, to actually act on it other than just going towards my house, getting closer to home. And so that's basically just the best defense in a moment, in a situation like that, just being as close to shelter as you possibly can. Um, other than that, it's a really safe mission. I mean, you could walk around with your camera all day long and no one would steal it, no one would do anything. I mean, obviously you're not gonna do that because you'd look a little bit like a tourist, but it's, it's really safe as far as that goes. And just, just be wary and you'll be fine. This next place is called Tanto Yuca, which is actually in the state of Veracruz. And all these ones I've been talking about, they're in different states. So this one's in, in Veracruz. And 
it's really one of the most beautiful places that I got to see in the mission because they're these giant green rolling hills. I say rolling, they're more like vertical hills. They're really steep, but it's just so beautiful. And every everything there, at all times, there's fruit bearing trees. And it seems every tree has fruit. There's, there's mangoes, lychees, um, like even peaches, all sorts of things. And so anytime you go there, you'll be able to, to eat fresh fruit. And anyone during mango season, everyone has a mango tree. And during mango season, they'll just give you bags and bags of mangoes a day that you just can't possibly eat. This is also another branch. It's one of the biggest branches I've been in. Actually, I don't know why it's a branch because it has more members than any of the wards I served in. We had an average attendance of about 100 to 110 there. And it, it was great. I loved this area as well. I didn't get to spend as much time there, but it was definitely a beautiful place. Great people, very accepting, and, and very interesting, the history and everything of the place. And the public transportation there is actually taxis, but the taxis are all really cheap, so you can take a taxi, and it's fine. But still, yet again, walking with hills. So it's also known as uh, Tanto Hoyos, Tanto Hoyos, which is, is like saying so many holes, because you know, the roads are bad, and, and there's just so many hills that, that it's an adventure going from one point to the next. So the first area I served in was Soto La Marina, and it's a little town. It's super small in uh, one of the northern regions of the mission. It's very desert-like, being dry, windy, and very sunny. There's a river that goes right through it, named the same as the town, and uh, there's a little branch there with, with about 30 members, 30 active members. The town itself has no public transportation, so it's all just walking, but it's small enough that it doesn't really matter. So in this town of Soto La Marina, it, it actually used to be the capital of the state, uh, but a long time ago. And it's really interesting because there's actually a lot of history to the town. I didn't get to learn all of it, but it's this really old town and there's a few really old buildings. It shows really well all the different structuring types so like the the stone of a couple old government buildings that were made in the 1800s then you have a lot of you know houses made out of mud and and branches then a lot of concrete house houses which is what they have mostly down there and just kind of this big mix up of a lot of things a lot of Parts of the town are a little older, and so they have a little bit different architecture. And so it was a really interesting little town, and it was one of my favorite areas. The whole city is called Ciudad Valles, which is, you know, city of the valleys. And it's because it's kind of like Salt Lake, wherein it's just a giant valley in between a mountain range. And so, but it's very different from Salt Lake because it's extremely hot. It's one of the hottest areas in the mission, and I was there during some of the hottest months. So it, it's really great because um, it's really big, really open, tons of areas. It's actually a stake there, so there's tons of members, but it's also extremely hot. And the house I lived in actually didn't have air conditioning, and it was one of the worst houses in my mission. All the houses are, are generally clean, but this one was just really small and it got really hot and we didn't have AC, so it was really bad. <laughs> but overall, I still enjoyed my time. And also, this city's really, really cool because up in the mountains, if you go up in the mountains, they have cascades, natural waterfalls and cascades with beautiful, clear blue water. As a missionary, you obviously can't swim in it, but um, the people, they actually go to these cascades to, to swim. And so I guess kind of returning back, you could do that. But it's a, a beautiful area and it's also an area called, it's a region of Mexico called the Huasteca, which is named after a tribe there, the Huastecan people. And so there's a lot of indigenous people who speak um, Huasteco or Tenec. 
and so they they speak a different language and they they have their own culture and it's kind of cool to to see that and learn about that in Valles, they do have a transportation system because it's an actual city and so they have a bus system and then a taxi system you generally take the bus but um, more than anything in this in this mission as well as this area you're going to be walking there are no bicycles in the mission and so it's just walking and public transportation so that's in this area you you get the opportunity to ride a bus sometimes and so that's that's always nice then my last area was a place called Altamira which is again another port city it's a little bit to the north of Tampico again there's people who work in refineries and people who work in the port this this place is it's almost like an extension of Tampico but a little bit um, further off it has three or four wards there right now and so they for a time they're pushing for it to be a stake itself and they'll probably be in in the not so distant future within a couple of years they'll probably be its own stake and so there's there's a decent amount of members there as well and it's not nearly as large of a city as Tampico or Madero but but it definitely is um, not a little town it it has again most commercial shopping areas that you need not a Walmart but you know the Mexican equivalent um, as well as you know it's big there's there's a lot of missionaries in these areas so I mean it's a really good area again it's it's kind of more deserty because you're getting towards the north but generally it's it's a little bit cooler than being so close to the coast like Tampico it's a little drier so it's not as wet but it's still not quite as dry as you know my first area where it's basically a, a desert this this area was I served in two two areas in this city so I got kind of the perspective of both areas one was more suburban and then the other area was more kind of country you could say and so I actually, I actually end up liking the countryside a little bit better so because the people are more inviting in these areas normally they're more apt to listen to you and to invite you into their home than than in a city or in a suburban area where they either don't want to listen to you or maybe they don't have time or whatever it is but the people in the country are more laid back and so so they just they might be sitting on their porch and you can just go up and talk to them and and start a conversation and maybe have a lesson there and that's why i always liked the country areas like that there's a lot of extreme weather in tampico and and everywhere else but i'd have to say the most extreme weather i experienced was my first area we were at an appointment it was late at night just very windy and it felt kind of off and so we decided after this appointment we were going to head home good thing we had decided that we were packing up and all of a sudden it just started pouring down rain and we were actually so far from our home we had to run home in the rain and within minutes there were puddles half a feet deep half a foot deep well, half a feet half a foot deep in in the streets and we were running we were completely soaked in the five or ten minutes it took us to get home so it was just amazing how windy and, and rainy it got so quick and then it rained all that night and the next day it was just like a swamp the entire town well, that was the most extreme weather that i experienced i ate armadillo once which i would term as exotic and then fruits, there's just so many. I couldn't even name them all. Star fruit, which a lot of people know here, but it's common down there. Um, lychees, also, it's like a little red, a red skinned fruit with, with like a, this white jelly kind of stuff in the middle. Um, also, dragon fruit is natural there. It's an actually, it's actually a cactus, and there's just a plethora of fruits there that are all exotic. I was never really really close to to a gunfight or anything but in one of my areas we we're in a district meeting and and we just got a bunch of reports from members on all of our phones and everything it basically said stay inside stay wherever you are because sun's going down kind of thing and we didn't really know at the time but there there was a fight in between a, a gang and the police and it was like super close to us and we did hear a couple of shots, but we just were in the church. We just stayed there. And then afterwards, we had to go home because it was deemed like, you know, kind of unsafe. But, you know, we were just sitting there and 
and we kind of weren't involved at all. So it was kind of really dangerous, but at the same time, we didn't know because it didn't really affect us. Kind of protected as a missionary, it seemed. In the church manual, it says um, 12 white shirts, four long sleeve, eight short sleeve. That's generally a good rule, but then you're probably going to want to convert some of those long sleeves to short sleeves later on in the mission, which you can just do with the seamstress there for really cheap. But maybe not even pack all four, maybe just two or three, because the only time you're really going to use them now is in the winter. Maybe they've changed the regulations because now you don't even have to wear a suit in that mission. But um, just in case they do, just so you know, you need more short sleeves. They need long sleeves. Yeah, just follow the list and you should be pretty good. I was okay. Just make sure to bring money or a debit card or some some way to get money. You don't really need cash. American U.S. currency is kind of an inconvenience there. So, I mean, I wouldn't recommend bringing a lot of currency because you have to you know, go to a place to exchange it. And in Mexico, you need your ID. And so you'd need your passport to do that. And your passport stays in the office to make sure it's safe. So it's probably a low likelihood you're going to get that. So just for easy thing, you can get a debit card from home and just use that in the ATM there. There's ATMs that only charge you a small transfer fee of two or three dollars for, for taking out, you know, of a US account. And so I mean it's it's decent and it's easy. Just bring a card. You don't need currency. In your mission you just gain an appreciation for so much. And I mean just one of the spiritual life lessons I learned is is to study and pray with with real intent and to do it honestly and to to really put effort into it. There's a couple times in my mission where you know I just didn't want to study. I just didn't feel like praying and the next day or the rest of that day it it's not a good day and so whenever you you do something you know do it honestly do it truthfully and if you're praying tell God like honestly right now I don't feel like praying but I'm doing it because I should and and you know can you help me feel better because we're weakest whenever we feel we don't need to do something or we feel like oh, I don't want to do that slash I can't do that or anything like that. So just the biggest life lesson, one of the biggest life lessons is is to always do to everything to the best of our abilities, be that spiritually or physically. There's so many spiritual experiences, but one was with one of my converts, we were teaching his family and and they were all ready. They, they were, you know, the whole family in general was doing everything that they should but this one brother was just, you know, having a hard time. I don't know if it was making up his mind or, or just, you know, taking that last step. But he had a problem with, you know, drinking alcohol as well as coffee. And so we thought, oh man, we gotta work with him because he needs to stop doing this. And the hardest thing is gonna be the alcohol, obviously, because he actually even worked for, for a beer company it's like, oh, this is going to be terrible. And so we talked to him about it and how he needed to stop. And that's what we thought would be like the final push to help him. Like that's what was going to give him his answer. And he said, you know, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. And so we came back the next week. And it ended up being that he dropped instantly alcohol and coffee. And it was, it was really amazing. But he, it was funny because he said it, I, I could drop alcohol anytime, but coffee, that's the hardest for me. And so we just kind of put out a plan to help him. And it was amazing to see this brother grow from this shy and timid um, guy who, who we didn't know if he could ever get baptized because he just didn't want to accept it almost, to this man who just became a spiritually deep and um, open person about, about his beliefs. In, in such a short time from this one experience, he just, he changed and was eventually baptized because he, he just grew so much spiritually from this experience. Congratulations, that's, you're going to the best mission on the face of the earth.
And I'm not just saying that. That mission has completely changed my life. The people there, both missionaries, members, and non-members, are some of the best people on this earth. I honestly know that that you're going to enjoy your time and, and you'll get what you put out of it. You'll get so much more than what you put put into it. I know that that the Lord is, is over his missionaries. He's over his missions and he is engaged in what you're doing. He's engaged in what's happening in each branch, board, and members' lives even. I've seen the hand of the Lord in, in so many experiences in my mission that I can't even count them. I know that, that the Lord will bless and protect you. And I know that, that you're going to be excess, a successful missionary as long as you study, do what your mission president says, and always try your best to, to be the, the best servant of the Lord that you can. I know that this mission will... Honestly, it's one of the cheesiest phrases you can say, the mission is the best two years of your life. And I know that without a doubt. And I invite you that you can always be worthy of the Spirit so that He can guide you in all that you do.